Brian. Um, so I went to the diversity forum yesterday and today for most of it, um, well, for the for the opening keynotes. Um, and in one of the breakout sessions yesterday, they were talking about um, COVID-19 and the sort of extra stresses that that are hitting um, our different populations. And, and, what, and I asked the question, what can we do um, as instructors as far as teaching practices go to to sort of implement practices. Um, and one of the things that the, uh, and I forgot her name, um, one of them said, uh, was, hey, add an, uh, add a land acknowledgement. And I was like, that's a thing that I can do. Um, there is verbiage at the university site uh, to do such a thing. So I went ahead and I did it. Um, the thing that I added to it, and I don't know, I'd love to have your feedback on it, I guess. Um, that last paragraph. So there's land acknowledgement, but then there's also sort of a commitment, uh, aspiration uh, that we strive to honor the land and the nation. Just sort of a, you know, it's important to acknowledge that that we're on land, especially for a land grant university, that um, we've taken over. Um, and what are the things that we can do to um, sort of make amends of sorts? Uh, so I added this paragraph about, um, whoops, there, that didn't work. Let me just exit that and go back to it this way, so I can highlight it. So we're gonna try to uh, do some things and, and uh, honor the land and the nation. And what I did is I tied in the Wisconsin experience there, right? Uh, empathy, humility, uh, relentless curiosity, intellectual confidence, purposeful action. Um, and talk about why and how. So yeah, eventually Sid, I, I, I need to want to, to dig into more and find out like what are some uh, ways we can do these kinds of things a little bit more effectively. Um, without putting extra burden on, you know, an individual to be a spokesperson for everyone. So it's it's asking someone from Ho-Chunk who makes that their job or that effort. So it's not just a, but yeah, I don't know what to do with that. So I'm, I'm putting it out there, I'm trying it. Um, and I just, I guess wanted to, something about that. All right. Um, let me share the uh, our activity sheet for today. So the topic of nine days after Thanksgiving came from summer. I was asking folks what, uh, what different topics would people like to see and uh, us do in uh, and uh, an active teaching lab this fall. And one of them came up with this this title and I was like, oh, that's right, because after our Thanksgiving, we're all moving remote. And there are a number of people that are teaching in a face-to-face -face situation who, this, after Thanksgiving, they're gonna have to shift all to a remote situation. And that might be a difficult thing for them. Um, so I thought, well, let's let's take a look at that and address, see what happens, see what, uh, See what we can learn from them, uh, or what we can say about it. So, I start off with, you know, in some ways we've already done this. This is our second time shifting to room. Uh, we did it right after spring break in spring. So if you taught in spring, you there's a good chance that you have also. Um, let me make this a little bit smaller, bigger. There we go. You've done this and you probably have a list of things that um, you experienced in spring that you're like, oh my gosh, this went much easier than I thought. Starting with the positives. Or, oh my gosh, this was terrible. I need to fix this if I ever do this again. And we're doing it again. Maybe you did it again in the summer and you fixed it. Um, and if that's the case, whatever your experience is, uh, whether you witnessed something being done 
heard about it from somebody else doing it, or did it yourself, tried it yourself, what we're going to talk about. What are the things that we learned um, last spring and this summer about remote instruction and shifting from a face-to-face -face instruction mode to a remote instruction mode? And we, how can we do this effectively? So I've got a list of like, here's some 10 tips. Um, and I took this uh, pretty much paraphrase from the how to overcome classroom Zoom fatigue um, because a lot of the topics, they're, they're not just obviously about Zoom fatigue, but they're about this whole sort of movement to we're interacting with a screen now instead of with individuals. We lose a lot of that nonverbal affirmation that uh, people are getting it. Um, and in some ways, this is a good thing, right? Because we would, or at least speaking for myself, I would often look at a couple of the familiar faces in the room and say, oh, this is, um, you're getting it because they are smiling and nodding. So I use that and I say, you're my bellwether, you're my parakeet or whatever. If you're alive and everyone else is alive there as well. And that's not necessarily a good thing because there are always a couple of people that are very actively engaged and they do not represent um, everyone else in the class. So one of the challenges here is to how do we how do we pay attention and get feedback from everyone else in our class, besides the few people who turn on their cameras, for example, and are like, oh yes, I'm listening, I'm watching, I smile, I nod, I get it, I look pensively, and I then I acknowledge and affirm that I'm following along. That person does not represent everybody in the class, so we have to figure out other ways of doing that. So there's all kinds of options, right? Informal meetings, right? How many of you are having office hours more often or individual one by one on one meetings? They're easier now, right? Because all you got to do is click a link and look at the camera and we're getting used to that now versus have some student trudge all the way across campus at a certain time. And, you know, that's that's extra work. One of the ideas that I thought was brilliant was you've got often as an instructor, um, maybe not as a, a student, but maybe as a student as well, sort of an office space carved off perhaps where you have a screen or two besides your laptop. Um, or maybe you have a big enough screen that you can have a set of notes open as well. Now, it's awkward to do this in a face-to-face -face setting to say, all right, hang on one second, let me get your file out and go through that. But here we can do that. I can have a list of, of everybody in my class with little cheat note cards about so-and-so is interested in that, so-and-so is interested in that. This is the project that so-and-so is working on. And I can refer to that as I ha have conversations with them individually or even in class. Um, and that way when I make a point and I say, oh, this point's going to be relevant to so-and-so, I can do a quick check and say, oh, and this would affect you because da 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 in a way that, of course, is respectful and not reaching confidentiality. The idea of asking people um, to be able to share a little bit more, but also to be a little bit more informal yourself, because you can see inside their rooms and their houses, and that's a that's a level of intimacy that we have not had in the past with a lot of our students, right? They all come into this very sterile classroom, and it looks like the other classrooms that they have other classes in, and everybody's sort of in that uh, it's not an equal space necessarily, but it's a standardized space. Um, this is different, so it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit more informal, a little bit more intimate. And I think acknowledging that, um, figuring out ways to keep it from getting too informal and too intimate is important. But there's a balance there. Again, in getting their feedback, recognize that your students are in a lot of they do this all day, right? You teach one, two, three classes. Um, your students are taking four or five. Um, they're, you know, or, or a few, I don't know, in different places, different instructors, different teaching styles. So while we look at things from our perspective, we rarely get a chance to peek into other rooms and see how other instructors do the teaching that they do. Um, but our students see that, and we can ask them to do that. I talked a little bit about this in number uh, three, the sharing more. We can ask them specifically, hey, this is a weird format that we're in right now. 
I need your help because I'm I feel like I'm talking to a vacuum. So give me some feedback, you know, pop into the chat and give me those affirmations that I look for um, in a face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, speak up more than you might usually step in a classroom because I need that level of participation. I don't want to just be the one performing and talking. We're going to get to that later on in our um, lab here in this uh, activity sheet that you can start adding your questions to. Preview, hint, uh, foreshadowing. So just go ahead and jump in there as I'm talking here. And then center on the students, of course. Keep the content and the learning practices focused on building their conversation, their connections and their conversations to it and each other. Remember that they are not you and your interest in why you think this is interesting, the topic that you're teaching, is not the same as theirs. You've got to get out of your brain and out of your epistemic lens that you've spent you know, your life getting to and say, well, how are my students looking at this? Um, and ask them, again, ask them. Breakout rooms are, they're just good. They're, they're hard. Um, people don't like them. And I admit that I don't like them until I'm in them, and then it feels like, well, OK. But the idea of going into a breakout room, especially a breakout room with people that I don't know already, um, that's, uh, you got to put on your leg. It's like going to a party and mingling. Um, some people are good at that. I'm, I'm OK at it, but I don't like it. Um, I just want to be in a group of trusted people and not have to do that extra work. So think about that. Use it regularly, but is there a way that you don't have to put that extra work on the students and say, all right, you're going to meet new people today, and tomorrow you're going to meet new, new people, and we're, you know, keep on meeting new people. And they're like, oh, that's too much for me right now, especially during this time where I'm, you know, anxiety is high um, with COVID and the election, and I'm full course load, and uh, I'm at home, and I've got to deal with my parents or my siblings that's, you know, too much. So can those places become, if not safe space, at least trusted, known, familiar spaces with the same three or four other people that you get to know after a while so you don't have to do that extra work as a student. But it's also a, a, a regular thing. The reason it's good is, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, students can give better feedback to each other oftentimes than you can. And by better, I don't mean more correct, because you're the expert, you can give them correct feedback. But they can connect with each other better than, than we can, oftentimes. Um, because they speak the language, they know culture. Um, I'm not on TikTok. I can't talk about the latest thing that's being passed around there. They can. And they might even be able to bring it into a conversation about um, the topic that you're discussing. I say they. And that's a generalization, of course. We've got non-traditional students who have the same struggles that I, that I have, similar struggles of, of, of connecting and bridging um, uh, culture gaps and such. But many of your students can. At least there's better opportunities for a group of four in a group of four um, to reach a fifth person than there is in a group for you in a group of 50 or however big your class is to reach that one person because you're too focused on the other 49 or the other however many. So unload some of that work to your um, to your students and have them teach each other. Breakout rooms do that. As do short student presentations, right? And we can do this now pretty easily. Uh, people are getting more and more familiar with this. You just make them a moderator or a presenter. They can share their screen. They can talk things through. They can have narrated PowerPoints that they upload. That's kind of taken over the space of the stand in front of the room and give a presentation, five minute presentation that you're stressed out about. Um, so it's a little bit different. You can also have them give live presentations, of course, uh, in a synchronous meeting. Reflection is important, again, not only for them as, an, uh, as, a, as a learner, but also reflection for you to see their reflection is important for you as an instructor because you can use that to see if they're getting it. 
Um, and again, you're not going to see that unless you make it an assignment, you give them points, you give them extrinsic reason for doing that, or you can work very hard in those informal spaces and meetings to say, so, a uh, student in our one-to-one -one meeting that we have every week, because I've got time to meet with 50 students every week, right? What's going on? Are you getting this? How did it go? Just build it into assignment, make it a short little tweet-sized, um, this was useful because of X, Y, Z. All right. Um, and uh, end early as you, if you can. Uh, again, we are all suffering from Zoom fatigue. So if you're done with the content and your students are getting it, do it. All right. Thank you, Sid, for jumping into the chat with that. Um, um, you're one of the people who would leave a presentation if you didn't want to do a breakout group. Yeah. So would I. And we've had people that I know are really good in breakout groups and generally like to be in breakout groups, but on that particular day, um, if they, they jump in uh, to the to the active teaching lab and they say, oh, there's a breakout group? I just can't do it today. Today I can't do it. So yeah, that's hard. Yeah, and for me, the part of it is being expected to be uh, interesting and con c contribute at the spur of the moment. If I could have a chance to think ahead of time, that would really help. Yeah, and this gets to the universal design for learning and the idea of multiple means of of representation um, and uh, engagement, multiple means of expression. If you say we're only going to do this through a breakout where you have to on the spur of the moment with a question that I will reveal in just a moment, your stress level starts going up, right? Um, that's tough for some students. Some students love it, right? And they're the one, like, yeah, I love speaking on the spot and jumping in with my brilliant whateverisms, witisms. Um, but for some people, they would rather do that in a discussion form. They would rather have the opportunity to think about what they're going to say before they're forced to say it, to type it all down, proofread it. Double check it with maybe a, another internet source or whatever. Have a friend look at it and then say, OK, I feel confident about this. I'm going to hit the submit button. Now we can discuss. That's a huge plus one for these synchronous, I'm sorry, asynchronous options. So all right. And then I love this. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, what is your biggest concerning for the uh, for the impending transition to 100% remote? Boom. Here we even have a space for you to put that. Um, if you would like to put in a, a concern or a, a challenge, a question or an obstacle that you have, something that you're struggling with and that you use the brain power of the other uh, 16 people in this session to help you figure out, uh, this is a great opportunity. This is one of the things I love about the Active Teaching Labs. It's not just my experiences, which are limited or secondhand or thirdhand oftentimes, but it's your experiences many of you know sometimes firsthand experiences um, and some of you are experts at some of these things because you've owned them and figured out how to do them beautifully over the years um, so we're going to hop on to the questions and answers um, i will also just do a quick uh, review of the uh, activity sheet here i've got i broke it down into communication so issues about how do you communicate? Can you communicate more? Can you, you need to communicate more in a remote setting? How do you do that? What are some ways you can do that? We think about active learning as something that happens in the classroom because it feels more active when the body, we can see the bodies moving and the, the voices um, chatting and such, and you can hear the chatter. But active learning can t happen in remote instruction as well. So we've got um, a lot of resources that have been put together on the knowledge base, the campus knowledge base documents right now. Um, listed out here, uh, both for uh, remote instruction and also for large courses with remote instruction. You can still do peer learning, right? And a lot of resources here for peer learning. Um, you can still ask the students um, and uh, use the elements of the uh, of the Wisconsin experience. Get them involved and engaged in that so that they know that one of your expectations or hopes or aspirations for them is to become more intellectually confident, have more empathy uh, for the other people in your field, uh, more curiosity, 
uh, for the field, uh, passionate and, and purposeful about what they do. And of course, equity inclusion is a thing that we keep on talking about. And um, for getting feedback, I apologize. I've only talked a little bit about polling here. Ideally, there'd be a lot more things uh, that we could talk about. All right. So back to our questions and answers. I, and I would like to um, take this moment to have you unmute your microphones and jump into a uh, audio conversation uh, if you have a question that you'd like to ask um, that might be a little bit more complicated or one uh, or simple, too simple or uh, specific for you to be able to type out into the, the format of the, the table here. Yes, yeah, Scott, thank you. Go ahead. Well, this isn't so much a question as an observation. Um, one thing, once we went online um, back in September, I just stayed because I figured I wasn't going to play the yo-yo game. Didn't know how, what the future held, and I knew we were going to end up online anyway, so I stayed online. And much to my astonishment, um, the level of, of uh, verbal participation in the class has, is higher than I've ever seen it in any class I've ever taught. And we're consistent, oh, yeah. consistently seeing 90 to 100% of the students contribute to conversations. How? And <laughs> I don't know why. It's a tribute to this particular mix, you know, the class personality. Um, the numbers are small. We started with 20. We've lost five along the way. Um, and we did have a cup that first week where everybody got, actually got to meet each other in person. But it's just I've told them that I'm amazed at what they're doing so if anybody else has a similar experience and you figured out how it, how how and why it's working please share that idea and i think that cliff just put in chat maybe it's because you're an awesome instructor um and i think that there's actually like i have no idea how, how good of an instructor you are but i will say that you're probably a better instructor for the remote space than you were that first session that you had right because we're getting better at these things. We adapt, we're humans. Um, the first time I tried to do this active team lab in this space, I was scared out of my pants. I, I was wearing pants, um, but, you know, expression. And it, it just felt awkward and weird, and I stumbled, and I, I feel like I'm getting, I hope I'm getting a little bit better at it right now. I certainly feel I'm learning things. Um, so I hope, you know, we all do that. We we get better the first time you taught in a face-to-face -face session. Your class probably sucked. Um, but, you know, after the third, fourth, fifth, hundredth time, you get better at that thing. So I think the same is probably true for the students, right? And they, and I, I, a question back to you. What uh, medium do you do that in? Are you in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra? Yeah, I use Blackboard yeah, Collaborate Ultra. I haven't and figured out Zoom yet, so I'm sticking with Blackboard for now. That's fine to stick with that. Well, Blackboard is still the uh, the supported tool for teaching and learning. Zoom is uh, on campus, but it's not a supported tool for teaching and learning um, yet. We're hoping that that'll build up. We just don't have the resources to do that right now. Um, do you run with the chat? Do you do asynchronous options, or is it only them with their cameras on talking to each other? Um, it's mostly well. It's we. It's mostly just synchronous. Uh, I call it a virtual roundtable. Okay. You know, it's small enough that we can sit around all one, all of us sitting around a table. Although we we do breakout rooms as well from time to time. But yeah. um, and even with the when everybody's there, it's it's just it's very vibrant conversations going on. Um, what's interesting in this group is that they're not using chat very much. I when I oh. taught last spring. I couldn't get the students to talk at all. It was all chat. Yeah. I have a point. I have appointed one of the students to be the chat moderator. We really haven't needed it because they've been just sharing, sharing verbally. That's cool. Are there other folks who have uh, who have experienced that or or had have some thoughts and theories on that? I guess I've got one other question. I know that when people take Karen Skiba's Teach Online at UW um, course and they design an online course, they all say that their 
um, their face-to-face -face teaching is better because they've sort of taken this time to think deeply about how an online course would go. So they're able to take things from the online course and, and um, apply it to a face-to-face -face setting. I know that we, when we first move to an online setting, we take what we did in a face-to-face -face setting and we say, how do I do this in an online setting? And I'm wondering if there are things in your online teaching that you would say, you know, now that I've done this this way in the remote or online setting, I've got a structure that I'm going to try that next time I'm face to face in my classroom. Like, is there a is there a back and forth that happens, or is it only a, a back or a forth? Or is it both? So it's kind of neat. Um, it's a theory you don't have to answer, but people are learning more about the different mediums, and it's kind of like any time that you look at a thing from multiple perspectives, the same thing, right? You're teaching the same class, but here you're looking at it from an online format. Here you're looking at it from the uh, handle side in a face-to-face in a -face format, and it looks different. And we, but it might help you understand more about the shape of the mug. Karen, go ahead. So kind of uh, based on what Scott was saying, uh, we teach, I teach in uh, veterinary anatomy, and we uh, have 96 students, but we teach them in groups of 24 for some of our synchronous sessions. And so I will be doing the exact same session for 24 different students. And it's very interesting, as you were describing, you know, some of them want to put out everything in chat. Some of them want to raise their hands. And, and so for us, I mean, been the same content, like we are just the same, but you know, every uh, 45 minutes with base change. And so it's, it's kind of culture of that group of that cohort that you'll see some that are super chatty in the chat and some that want to raise their hand and talk. And so, and that's just kind of, um, and, it's, and we teach them week over week, but, but with those synchronous sessions that we've been forced to teach, there's some good stuff where we weren't able to be in the lab with them as we have before. And so we really had to think about what clinical application we would like to express, what videos, and that, all of that. And so I think moving forward, some of those sessions that we've created this year will continue to live even once we are completely free so so you're doing back to back sort of 24 students then a different set of 24 students and yep, a different we, set of 24 we, students? They, they stay in the same place and we there's four instructors and we uh -oh. then rotate from each breakout room so we have just sessions blackboard sessions and so we go from where we have our we call them bay so bay a b c and d and so we move to the different blackboard sessions the students stay the All same right. and so we do the same session four times and you can see big differences as to preference you know, some of them love to put on the slide, some of them want to put it in the chat, some of them want to raise their hands. And so it's, it's us, we're the same, but there there's uh, culture differences among those cohorts of students. So I wouldn't... so that must have been very challenging the first time you know, to, to get used to, that sort of bouncing around from culture to culture of the classroom. Or my and, and to some extent, so we kind of work with, because I, I was asking in the last session, I wanted them to raise their hands. And there was like, the first group I went in were totally like, we'll raise our hands. And right on the slide, the second group were like, we want to be anonymous. And I was like, I'll work with what I have. Work with what I have. And you're getting better at it. I imagine you're more used to it. So the more that we become familiar with things, the better we are to, the, the easier it is, I guess. That makes sense. You never go in the same order. So it's it's because you, wherever, which, cause whatever bay you start in, we rotate. So it's it's a little, it's kind of like a box of chocolate. So we, we go with it. Very good. All right, and Yulia in chat says, uh, students talked or wrote in chat a lot more for the discussion sections. Uh, so fewer than 20 students. I think size is part of it. Yeah, that makes sense. If you're one of 100 students or 200 students or whatever, um, you might be a little bit more, want to be a little bit more anonymous. Uh, whereas if you're in a smaller group, and this is true with breakout groups, um, as I was saying, if you're familiar with the people already, the same 20 people, um, you can get familiar with them. Um, and even more so, if you're in a group of five within that group of 20, uh, that group of five you'll be more familiar with. And yeah, some students do like talking with their classmates and socializing that way, but also some don't. So it's a, uh, it's kind of a balance, right? We, there will be some students who we want to do things that they don't want to do, and it's important perhaps that they do that, um, but we don't want to make do that all the time. We also want to make people who do want to talk all the time 
have them shut up and or or, or type things out in a discussion asynchronously uh, because we want to it's a balance it's a compromise right and for you as well as an instructor you cannot be that ping pong ball and just go wherever they want to go you have to say uh, i have i have a system it's flexible it will allow multiple choices or multiple options for you multiple means again the universal design i will give you some multiple means but i can only handle three or five or seven or whatever i can't handle 200 you know one for each one of you i create a custom experience for everybody in my class so there's that balance as well good good discussion um Duncan, yeah, the uh, option to students to stay in the main room and not enter a breakout room. I was thinking about that too. Um, it's a trick, isn't it, right? Because if you say, hey, students, we're going to break up into breakout rooms, go find your room. And if you don't want to be in a breakout room, you can stay in the main room with me. And basically what you're saying is you're going to stay in a weirder breakout room because I'm going to be in it and facilitating things and making sure that you talk, right? So that's kind of a, it's kind of a instructor trick or uh they're still in a breakout room because they're not in with everybody, but we're going we're gonna to do some breakout stuff in, in, in the main room here as well. So maybe there's maybe there is a, another activity that is less um, structured than the breakout room activity. And you just sit there and continue lecturing. But then you'd have the students that are in the breakout room being like, what are we missing out? What are we missing? What's, what's Duncan talking about? We should. Maybe we shouldn't be here amongst ourselves. We should go back into the main room. I don't know. Try it. Let me know how it goes. All right. Um, so we only have two questions here. Is this all that we really have? Y'all don't have other thoughts, ideas, questions, challenges? There is no struggle. There is no struggle in your life right now as far as uh, remote instruction. Come on. Let me encourage you to fill up the remaining spaces. And we'll start. We'll just go ahead and start. All right. As we approach the end of yet another intense semester. <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, I think as a population, I think the world feels a little bit more anxious than usual. Uh, things are getting shook up uh, a lot. and we're getting exhausted. Um, we know that and we've heard reports from different countries, different um, areas across the country that are going into lockdown for a second time. Like, uh, like we struggled through the first time. Our adrenaline carried us on, and then you know, after our adrenaline was used up, we had like some reserve energy, and that's being used up, and now. It feels like collectively, and I'm sure there are some people that are thrivers, right? The introverts out there. Um, but it feels like it's just too much, and we just can't do it anymore. So the energy is gone. Um, I don't see any answers there yet. Anybody got any answers here? Come on, help me out. Um, Acknowledge. I think acknowledging is helpful for people to I think oftentimes people will feel like, oh my gosh, I'm tired. Everybody else is seems to be performing um, in a way that they've got every, you know, all their crap together, all their ducks lined up, but I'm exhausted and I'm faking it. Um, imposter syndrome is happening all across. The chat rooms and Zoom hangouts uh, and such that you're in right now. So acknowledge that I look like I'm doing well, but I'm struggling here as well. Um, go ahead. Uh, let's see, Ethan. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me, John? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think acknowledging is just super important, and I definitely second that. Uh, I think one thing that helps and one of the reasons I'm like haven't written anything in here is because I'm actually not teaching this semester so I still have ideas but one of the things that I was going to say helps um, has helped in the past is 
um, built in leniency. Um, and, and maybe that's like planning to drop an assignment or, or actually doing it or something like that, where you, you back off a little bit. And I feel like that, um, at least for me in a, as a student in several situations has you know, kind of engendered a second wave of energy for me, it's feeling like I can manage it. Yeah, forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Put some forgiveness into your pedagogy. Give people a chance to sort of have those days where they're like, I just can't do it today. When that happens, don't don't make any days that are worth you know thirty percent of their grade, because there will be one student that'll wake up that day and just feel this sense of morass or what's the right word malaise. Um, they just can't do it, right? They just can't get out of bed. They can't. Something's wrong. Um, so make make it a series of five point five percent days instead of you know a significant thirty percent day, um, if possible. If possible, we recognizing that. Some of you have to have these very high stakes things. Julia, go ahead, and then uh, Will. Um, I was just going to say, uh, sort of related to what you said about acknowledging that we're struggling. Um, having check-ins really helped me when I was taking online classes this summer um, and last spring. Just starting class with something that's going well and also something that is not going well for people. So there is like a structured opportunity to acknowledge that we're not like nothing, nothing is perfect for anybody. Yeah. And when they hear that from each other, especially that that helps with the imposter syndrome because they will say, you know, right now we look around and we say everybody is doing well. Um, Judith Butler's performity, performativity, right? We're all performing, we're acting like professionals and like we're with it. Um, but if we can hear from our peers that they are struggling as well, um, that helps, that helps. And it, it actually eases the, well, it helps. I don't, I can't get into the details because I don't know them. Will, go ahead. So one thing that just, based on previous active learning uh, assignments is that we sent out an email this week and dropped the final exam. Uh, we we just said we're not doing it because we can't grade it well and not sure that it's going to do much in, in helping folks really retain the material. Um, so that's that's one thing that we did with that end of the nine days, those nine days after Thanksgiving is that we're just not going to do the exam. Um, what we have worked in, though, is asking them to look back on their material that they've created, the, the post, the writings, and synthesize that. So nothing brand new, not asking them to engage new material, but more do that synthetic work to help them uh, apply what they've learned and, and do that kind of um, you know, looking forward. In fact, we're planning on actually uh, having them write it to themselves about what they hope that they've done during the the pandemic and how they're going to continue to consume happiness, which is the name of the class, oh, nice. um, over the rest of the pandemic and send it out in a year uh, to say, here's what you do. Um, so yeah, more reflection, more, more integration and sy synthesis than actually high stakes, you know, end of the year stuff. In the remote proctoring um, active teaching lab that we had a couple of weeks ago, one of the things on the activity sheet uh, really focused on reflecting as an instructor, what all needs to go into that high stakes test? Are there things on that high stakes test that um, you don't, especially a timed high stakes test, don't have to be done in a timed manner? Um, where having it timed is actually not an authentic form of assessment. If so, take it off that uh, uh, take it off that assessment and address it in a, a smaller, uh, a, a different, uh, lower stakes uh, assessment. I think that this idea of um, instead of having a final exam, are there things that we can do that are uh, alternate, um, that are less stressful, that maybe are less time related or time constraint because time constraint, especially with the technology and uh, the, the 
the need to be on at this certain point, from this point to this point of your day, um, on a specific day, that's a lot of extra stress. That might be totally necessary in your field, right? Because you've got to get in and you've got to do something um, in your day as a professional uh, in your discipline that needs to be done that way, right? So we want to assess our students on can they do that? Have I prepared them for that? But there are so many things that are not um, that we still do in this sort of time constrained manner. Um, so think about is it necessary? All right. Uh, that was it for the questions. So that's good or, uh, for the for the hand raising. Thank you, uh, Will and Yulia and um, uh, Ethan for jumping in and and chatting there, and uh, Karen and Duncan for jumping into the uh, the chat as well. Next question: Should peer review be weighted on grade? If so, uh, what's recommended? What would be the should it be weighted or recommended? Uh, what is the best way to weigh peer review in a grade? Yeah, this is a this is really important point. So technically, students cannot grade each other. Um, as an instructor, you are the person that is responsible, um, or your TAs are responsible for giving grades that are in the grade book. What you can do with a peer review thing is you can say, hey, students, um, offer a grade, give feedback, um, fill out a rubric based on your understanding of this, but you need to go in and review that, or a TA or somebody who is one degree level higher than the students um, that are being graded needs to go in there and um, assign a grade for that, right? So your students can give each other feedback and they can give each other insight onto what's working and not working. They can inspire each other. They can learn from each other. And those are all really great reasons to do peer review. Um, they can see examples of how to do things and they'll pick things up because they see this other way of doing it than the way that they were thinking about doing it. But as far as grades go, whatever they give can only be a recommendation or a, something that you have to go in as an instructor and change. Um, so if your peer review, peer reviewers of your students say, um, a, B, A, you know, if they say, oh, this all has to be an A, that can't be 70% of your grade. And your 30% is like, no, this is an F paper. You can't figure out that kind of a formula. It's up to you to decide that. Um, that at least is my understanding of that. Anybody have a different understanding? Well, I made a comment on uh, the activity sheet. Great. Yeah, and I know, uh, Duncan, I was hoping that you would speak but, up because uh, you you have done a lot of peer review, I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, participation credit for doing the review, and, and that's all I'm... Yeah. But I was thinking... Yeah. Thing that's you know what's since You're breaking up for me. Are you? Am I? Yeah, it's sort of fading in and out. Does it help? This helps. I I can hear you. I see your connection is in red right um, now, though. You got a very low. Well, I can't. Yeah. Oh. Play. So All maybe right. just look at my comment in. Activity sheet. All right. Very good. And this is uh, this is your response, I think. So yeah. Um, and I'm going to reemphasize uh, the the last point about this. A rubric is important um, because it reinforces to the students that are doing the grading that these were the criteria criterion criteria that they need to look at, and they can see many different ways, or as many papers as they review, different ways of of reaching that criteria. Um, this is another beautiful thing about 
um, having a peer review or having students share uh, work with each other. If they're only doing peer review on one other person, then they have two ways of understanding or two examples to work from. The way that they did it, which of course is the right way, and the way that somebody else did it, which must be, you know, if it's different than the way that I did it, then it must be wrong, right? And that's not good because that sets up a weird dichotomy. But if they see two other papers or three other papers, they can start to recognize the, uh, the diversity, if you will, of ways to meet the criteria that are on the rubric. And they'll say, huh, I guess mine isn't the only way because they did it here in this way and they did it here in this way and this third person did it in this other way. So they can start to see that there are many paths up the mountain, many ways to reach that, uh, that criteria. The rubric is important to help them see that. All right, we got more information coming in about the rubrics and uh, ooh, goal is mastery, not assessment. Resonates. Good. I like that. Um, I'm going to wait for you to finish writing that, and we're just going to jump ahead to Duncan's question. Uh, sorry, the follow-up for Duncan's question. Is there a way for students to self-select into specific breakout rooms in Blackboard Collaborate? The answer is yes. Yes, there is. And um, I'd be more than happy to let Karen give a talk about that if she would like to. Otherwise, um, we can do that. Talk about the... All right. I'm, I'm back. Did you, what did you want me to talk about? I was just uh, responding the, to self-selecting into breakout rooms. Yes. Well, that's really that easy to do. Students? Yes. Just I provided the directions. Right? Yeah. I put oh. the directions on here. Can you hear me still? Oh. Yeah. Bless you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. So the directions, this wonderful KB from Do It AT that provides not just how to do it, but great pedagogical ideas. So. Um, awesome. But it is very easy, and you know, it's just a little arrow that people. If you, but the instructor has to set it up to be self-select, so you can't just it can't just happen. You have to select a little button when you're creating the the um, breakout groups. There's a little button to select to allow them to change groups, and then a little arrow will appear, a little green arrow that sometimes is hard to see for some. Uh, but then they can just click on that arrow and move between the different groups. What what I sometimes set up groups for different topics. That can be a fun way to set up groups too, is you, instead of maybe everybody talking about the same topics, to give them a choice of topics, and then you can type in the name of those topics in Blackboard Ultra. You have to do that like right before the session. You can't do it the day before. And then they can select their groups. Uh, they can select which topic they want it to do. And I've done that in a couple, and people appreciate it because sometimes they may want to talk about a slightly different topic. So yeah. that is a, a nice technique. That's a really good point. I've highlighted in the activity sheet here 20 ways to structure breakout group activities um, from a previous active teaching lab on breakout groups. Um, and it's kind of fun. There are, there are of those 20 ways, um, I'm going to say at, at least five are the choose your own uh, breakout room. And um, well, they, they, they offer, many of them offer a lot of that customization, that personalization that we strive for as educators um, to give our students so that they can find the ways to connect to the content in, in a meaningful way. Um, so that is there. And then, of course, there are others um, all along this peer learning. And, of course, in the active learning one. All right. So good. Thank you. Um, it is 154. We got time for this question here, and maybe one other one. Um, the idea of uh, the goal is the goal is mastery, not assessment. Um, that's you're right. That's beautiful. Um, when the goal is assessment rather than mastery, what we're doing is we're sorting out, right? And we're saying, I don't care who you are, what you learn. What I care about is are you the top of the class or are you the bottom of the class? And when teaching becomes the sort of filtering of, um, I'm only going to take the top 10% or, or whatever of you, it starts feeling really yucky for me. Um, I would rather have everybody master uh, the, uh, you know, become really uh, good at the content, at applying the content in different ways, ways that, are, um, that work for them. And that last part, in ways that work for them, 
is part of that last question of how do we define and measure mastery, right? Because there's a combination there, right? There's a balance. If you think about as a professional in your discipline, your area of mastery and how you master um, the content that you have that you've mastered to get to this point, it looks different from your colleagues, right? There are some parallels and some similarities. You're all you're all at the level where you can teach a one-on-one -on -one course, maybe, right? And we specialize and we come a little bit. Um, we have different ways of doing that as well. So when we think about assessing students um, for mastery rather than for assorting, we have to have different ways of, of, of doing that. That honor that they're all coming with different skill sets, uh, different experiences, different ideas and passions about how they're going to do this or how they're going to be themselves in this. And this happens in teaching, right? Um, we don't teach a here's how to here's the one way to teach this, you know, a class at the University of Wisconsin Madison. You all have different ways to be master teachers. So there is not a single definition or measurement of mastery. But within that, we do have some sort of professional expectations that you're going to know how to run Canvas and that you're going to be able to turn your grades into the registrar at the end of the semester and um, that the person who teaches the course in line after you, uh, the next course in the, in the series, isn't going to have a bunch of students who don't know how to do anything, right? So there are these sort of professional uh, levels as well. So it, it becomes a, a yes and. A, a, there are the things in our learning objectives that we know administration wants us to do, our certification programs want us to hit. Um, I, as an instructor, feel very important that we hit. But then there's also the how do we hit those things and also let our students connect to those things. And I think that that's a part of mastery that it's becoming more and more talked about um, in higher education, um, well, in, in education in general. All right, and uh, one other question here, two other questions uh, from our chat here. I'm just going to copy and paste them into this. Um, oops, do that one. There. Uh, parallel video conference sessions, one for the professor to share material and others for, oh, that was in res uh, to your breakout groups earlier, right, Duncan? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's kind of, do you want to stay in with a, sort of the, the lecture with me sharing it, um, where you can, as a student, be a little bit more passive? Um, or do you want to opt for the active learning, where you can socialize with other, other students and learn from each other? I, I think that's brilliant. I want you to do that. And I want you to <laughs> figure out five ways to know students. Yeah, because students do want both. Oh, oh. I don't know what the, you. How can they do both? Isn't that just the the back channel or the chat session that they're talking to each other with? I don't fully really understand um, what that is. I. It looks like you've got better re, uh, connection now. So can you pick up and uh, share? Well, I can't see who's in the uh, session right now. All I see is what you share. And then I see you. I don't know that there's anyone here except for chat. There should be a little link on the uh, lower corner that has participants. Or is that only visible for moderators to see? No, that just shows names. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that... So there is a, there is a, uh, for mine at least, it's a purple uh, three, uh, arrow on the bottom right that opens a panel and you can opt to look at attendees. Zoom actually works much better than BBC Collaborate to see people on there because instead of only having two uh, faces that can be shown at one time, you actually have it so it's a gallery view and you can see everyone. Um, Zoom is definitely my preferred um, method for 
doing this. I'm going to collaborate. I can't share from three people, and I can't see. I can see a list of participants with still icons, but not. Oh right, the the videos of the people. Right, you can't see the video of the of the people in Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Right, you can only when I'm sharing the screen. I think the only I can only see, um, right now my video and your video be or Will's video. Whoever's unmiked will come up there. Um, in Zoom, yeah, you're right, you can see a lot more people at a time. And even when you're sharing screen, you can have the option of having multiple images that you see at a time. You can't necessarily see everyone, but you can see up to like four or five. Yeah. Um, right. There's some sense of, you know, emotional content. So I'm thinking of running two parallel, either of where I'm sharing slides or, or showing videos or whatever I'm doing. And then have another students also open another Blackboard Collaborate tab. Yeah. But but if, you keep, even, in, even in Blackboard Collaborate, Duncan, if you use Blackboard Collaborate, they will only be able to see four people video video feeds besides themselves. Um, so so, be better. Zoom thing. I just haven't gotten around to straightening. Yeah, Zoom has more features. I'm not going to say that it would be better because that would be me encouraging people to use a tool that is not yet supported for teaching and learning, and I'm not going to do that. Um, but maybe next semester, when it, if and when it is supported, then that might be a choice to look at. I'm All right, hey, Peter, I'll, I want to let people go, but I also I will stick around for the next couple of minutes to carry on conversations. Um, so if you want to keep on talking about Zoom, um, stick around. If you need to go, you are free to go. Thank you for being here today, and. Um, I'm glad it was productive. Uh, I hope it was productive for everybody a little bit and um, stick around if you uh, if you'd like to and we'll keep on going.